One of the main stressors that I've ever experienced and, and some of the reasons that I've burnt out is because I just simply did not feel supported. And I think that having a good boss and being a good boss is probably one of the most important things that your nonprofit can uh, offer to people. Welcome to the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange, a podcast from IPM Advancement. Our mission is to help you raise more money so you can make the world a better place. Today's topic, self-care for nonprofit fundraisers, how to avoid burnout. Hello, listeners, and welcome to the first episode of season two of the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange. To start us off this year, we've assembled a panel of some of my favorite IPM team members to talk about an important topic that I don't think gets enough attention, how to avoid burnout in nonprofit fundraising. According to the Nonprofit Employment Practices Survey from Nonprofit HR, the rate of annual staff turnover for nonprofits is 19%. That's compared to 17.8% for all industries. So to put that in perspective, nonprofits have roughly the same turnover rate as healthcare, a field that's typically known for high rates of burnout. Today, we'll be talking about why burnout is such a challenge for nonprofits and what you can do to prevent burnout for yourself or your staff. Let's meet our panel. Hi, um, it's Diana Gardner. I'm Vice President for Client Development at IPM. This is Russ Banoff. I am Managing Director and Chief Strategist. And this is Samantha Timlick. I am Vice President of Client Services. And I am Curtis Schmidt, your host and moderator today. Thank you all for joining me. Let's begin with that statistic that I opened with. The annual staff turnover rate is 19%, so almost one in five. Does that fit with your experience? And why do you think turnover is so high, especially on the fundraising side? I have to be honest, within the nonprofit sector, you see this a lot. So those stats seem pretty true to me. I've seen this many times where, you know, clients are juggling just too many tasks, um, both professionally and in their personal lives. And, you know, ulti ultimately it translates into their work, such as, you know, missing deadlines or interactions can be terse. Um, and just the overall enthusiasm and love for the job wanes. And I think the reason why you start seeing this is that nonprofits, already pretty much have a pretty thin bench. And so, you know, the challenge of managing, of doing more with less really adds to overall fatigue and burnout. And, you know, when people go into the nonprofit sector, you choose to work there for a reason. It's certainly in most instances, not compensation or the financial reward, you run the risk of making personal and professional sacrifices from the get-go. Again, you know that you're probably not going to be, uh, your financial potential is not as high in other industries. The resources that are made available to you are probably not as plentiful in other industries. And sometimes advancement opportunities are also slim just by the sheer nature of the organization organization having a thin bench. Um, and and it, it, it's just, it makes it all that much more critical to love what you do. Mm -hmm. And so when you're suffering from burnout, and I've seen this a lot, that passion fades. And there's really no other real incentives that are driving you to stay there. So you know, hearing that 19% does make sense. And I see that a lot. And it's a shame because this is typically someone, people who go into the nonprofit sector have a true love and passion for the mission of the organization in which they're working for. And, um, you know, sometimes um, I'll, I'll frequently, according to the statistics, you see that folks just just that, that fire in the belly just fades because of, again, uh, lack of resources and, and because of uh, lack of financial incentive and advancement opportunities. Mm -hmm. I would agree. And, you know, I would add to that, that I think starting a new job is just like starting the new year, right? Like you go in and you're excited and there's all these opportunities. And to Diana's point, when you choose to work for a nonprofit, you're really doing it because you're trying to make the world better. So, you know, you come in with a rosy view and 
fortunately or unfortunately, at the end of the day, nonprofits are still businesses. They are much like a regular business in that sometimes the workplace culture might be less than desirable or it can be downright toxic. So when you come into a place where you have to work extra hard because of the limited resources and whatnot, and then you're also uncovering these office politics and finding that maybe you're not fully supported, I think it's easy to become disillusioned. You know, and I can speak for the IPM team here. We're not a nonprofit, but we work incredibly hard. And, you know, we're answering client calls or emails or texts after hours, weekends, and yes, sometimes even on holidays. And I got to tell you, if I didn't have a team supporting me and if I didn't love what I do, I couldn't keep doing it. Um, it just, it wouldn't be possible. And so I think, unfortunately, a lot of folks in the nonprofit fundraising sector find themselves in that position. Without naming names, can you share some actual examples of how employee burnout has hurt a nonprofit organization's fundraising program? Absolutely. I have an example. Um, you know, and, and we're, it, burnout is not just for the seasoned employee. It's also for the junior level employee. And you have to recognize talent when you see it. And I have, I have a client who had an incredibly talented self-starter um, junior manager for the annual fund program. And the volume of work this individual took on was just so expansive that many different departments came to rely on this individual and ultimately set this individual up for failure, unfortunately. And as a result, this person moved on to seek a, a better suited opportunity where they didn't feel just completely inundated with workload. And the result of that was there was a vacuum in this operations type role for over two months. And so as a result of that, resources had to shift where you have this void of someone who was incredibly instrumental for ensuring that the trains were running on time and not having someone there for two months delayed our processing of returns to be able mm -hmm. to gauge what the results were looking like. It delayed actual creative approvals because there was a backlog. So, um, you know, the consequences of, of burnout is very real and far reaching across an entire fundraising program. Hmm. It can be a serious problem for nonprofits and not an uncommon one. Let me share another set of statistics that I found interesting, this time from a survey by Chronicle of Philanthropy. They found that 84% of fundraisers said they feel tremendous pressure to succeed. That's a quote. 27% of those who are likely to leave fundraising in two years cite unreasonable goals as a key reason, and 36% said they're dissatisfied with the support they get from their boards. Is this consistent with your experience? So Curtis, I'd like to chime in on this one because the experience that I've had has largely been an annual giving, an annual fund. And that's where we see in terms of fundraising, a lot of the burnout that takes place in, in uh, advancement. And, you know, I, I think that those two points that you mentioned in terms of unreasonable goals and, and um, the second point being the support they get from boards or the lack of support people get from boards, you know, in, in a lot of organizations, there is a disconnect between the most burnout prone fundraising uh, roles, which is generally annual giving, uh, some of the lower level roles in, in the advancement team. Uh, there's a disconnect between um, what the higher ups and the management might set as goals and, and really not communicate with um, lower level staff. And, and also that connection uh, between board members and, and staff, uh, especially staff that are running annual fund, you know, annual fund is, is considered kind of the, um, you know, the, the black sheep of the fundraising family in a lot of ways. And it's a tough role to be in. And, and frankly, I, I don't meet a lot of people who have done annual giving their entire careers because typically it's just so burnout prone because, you know, it, the, the way that the job is set up is every year you're running a program that needs to be consistent you are asked to outperform yourself year over year over year, um, typically within that 
environment, you have to stick to some very strict budgets, or you might even have your budgets cut. So you're asked to do more with less. And, and I think that that kind of cyclical nature of the job and those challenges that just keep coming up, it, it makes it really tough to hang in there. And I think a lot of people uh, naturally want to look toward moving into more uh, moves management type uh, major gifts, plan giving positions where you're cultivating a portfolio. And that's kind of the natural progression. You know, you either stay a, sub, a subject matter expert and you continue as a subject matter expert fundraiser, but you move into higher levels of, of fundraising or you move more into management. And, and I think that those are the two tracks that people can think of when, when you start to feel burnout that's a good indication that it's time to start thinking about what path you want to be on, because frankly, it's very, very difficult to stay in annual giving for more than three, four, five years, especially if you're a self-starter, if you're really enthusiastic about things, you're, you're going to hit a wall at some point because annual giving, the nature of annual giving, you kind of have to work within a box. Mm. And uh, that's a very challenging thing for certain people. Good point. Burnout can come from repetition in addition to a high pressure situation. Now, I want to note that these statistics I've been quoting come from surveys conducted prior to the pandemic. What are you seeing in terms of COVID's impact on nonprofits and how is that impact affecting employee morale and burnout? So I'll just chime in one one more time to kind of build on what I just said about, you know, th that organizational aspect of, of working in a place where you're burnout prone. And, um, you know, that organization in these times, sometimes there's a lack of transparency, especially for lower level staff and an annual fund definitely fits into to that category. The folks who are, are doing the day-to-day -day fundraising in an organization, especially if it's a larger organization like a university advancement office or um, any you know large nonprofit that has uh, a lot of bureaucracy, th there's a disconnect oftentimes between running the day-to-day -day fundraising and actually knowing what's going on at the top level uh, in terms of budget numbers and, and how serious things are. And in that absence of information, it creates a vacuum. And it, it creates a situation where it's very ripe for people to start gossiping about, oh, you know, I don't know what's going to happen next year. And I've heard that there are going to be cuts. And it, it, you can really get into a very toxic environment, as, as Sam had mentioned um, at the top of the podcast, that can contribute to that toxic environment uh, of negativity, of worry. And that just places additional pressure on you as, as an individual. And, you know, just if you're just trying to do your job, that's a huge distraction action. And it's a huge weight on people uh, to have to worry about uh, the bottom line when, when it's not really something you can control. I mean, your, your job is to raise as much money for your program as possible. And, and it's a shame because even if you do that as an annual giving person, the organization still relies on other revenue sources and you're not in control of those. And so it can, it can really make for a very stressful situation. Mm. I think Russ makes a really good point. Uh, there when he spoke about lack of control. And I think that that's something that we're all experiencing outside of work too in our personal lives uh, as a result of this pandemic. So it's like our baseline level of stress is just elevated all of the time. And that's compounded by things like, you know, maybe your kids aren't in school right now, or maybe you have loved ones who are out of work. You know, you're socially distancing. You haven't seen your parents or your extended family in months, you know, almost a year now. And, you know, there's health concerns, there's financial concerns. It's we, the election last year was sort of nuts. So, so, I mean, I think that we're all operating under this higher level of just ongoing stress. And that really underscores everything we do. And it's, it's almost easy to forget about and therefore not take it into account when we're dealing with the additional stresses at work. And so I think it just, it just adds to everything. Yes, lots of uncertainty for sure. Let's now move to IPM's recommendations for ways to structure your fundraising program to prevent burnout. I'm sure there's a lot we can talk about here, but where would you recommend someone start if they want to avoid burning out their staff or themselves? 
Well, I'm really big on using your numbers. So Russ alluded to the idea that often fundraisers are being asked to do more with less. Um, and I think it's really important to always have very clear goals and ways of measuring and reporting against those goals that everyone can agree on. So if you're told, hey, your budget's being cut by 20%, you have less, less money to do what you need to do this year. I think it is entirely fair to use that information and those numbers and come back with a, okay, given that this is a situation we're in, here's what I think are the best ways for us to leverage that money to bring in uh, the fundraising dollars that we need, but here's the real likely impact of that cut. So nobody is surprised on the back end when things don't necessarily work out the same way because you know, trying to do more with less is dang near impossible. You approach it as best you can. You make the best plans you can. But if you can really come into it with everyone being on the same page and sort of understanding the challenges that you're facing, I feel like that's the best way to keep everybody moving with you as you go forward. One of the biggest complaints I hear um, from folks in nonprofit development is at the end of the year or at the end of the fiscal year, all of a sudden they've missed budget and everyone's like, oh my gosh, what happened? Why didn't you tell us? And they're like, I've been telling you the whole time. So I think using your numbers and documenting that and having a very clear uh, report card almost that you're sharing with the other people on your team and your leadership and your board to try and help bring them along the whole time, that keeps everybody from not having this sort of like last minute surprise, even though, I know you're not surprised and you feel like no one else should be. Um, it's really standardizing some of that stuff and reporting on it consistently that can, can sort of keep that from happening. Mm -hmm. You got to lean heavily on your partners and whether that's an agency, an outside firm, or it's interdepartment staff, I think being able to share responsibility does a lot of things. One, it sort of takes things off your plate a little bit and it makes others buy into what you're putting down. And I think that's really, really instrumental in um, ensuring morale is up, ensuring that everyone knows what's happening and that annual fund is not going to operate in a silo and your metrics are not sort of kept to your vest. And I think, again, leading, leaning heavily on on others to um, help lift you up and support your program becomes even more mission critical. Mm -hmm. I think to build on what Diana said, being in a situation where you're on a team um, and you really feel like you're working within a team and you're not just in your own world and you're not in your own kind of silo, that's really important. So even though you might have a very diverse team, you might have a plan giving person that you don't see very much, uh, you know, a major gifts and a leadership gifts kind of pipeline development person, you might have annual giving, you might have management. There really needs to be that kind of top down leadership by management to, to, to create a sense of team. It's super important with any non profit where you're, you're, you're working in disparate areas, but there's some overlap and you're certainly all working toward the same goal. And I think that w what we see in terms of successful nonprofits is when people actually know what's going on from this side of the house to that side of the house. It's, it's, it's really important to not just kind of live in your own world, meet your own goals and really have no idea what, uh, what other people are doing. And, and by creating that sense of team, that also allows you to have a little bit of a, a um, stress relief valve and be able to share your concerns. And hopefully that, that uh, connection, that sense of uh, openness and that transparency extends all the way up to leadership and extends to management and that you are, you feel supported because I, I think if we're talking about burnout, one of the main stressors that I've ever experienced and, and some of the reasons that I've burnt out is because I just simply did not feel supported by my, uh, by my direct boss. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, that having a good boss and being a good boss is probably one of the most important things that your nonprofit can, can uh, offer to people. And one other thing I want to mention too, in terms of burnout and specifically in terms of annual giving is, you know, we've done a lot of 
uh, blog posts and talking and white papers, uh, podcasts about this evolving nature of annual giving. You know, annual giving is not just about rolling out the same program every year, and that's all you do nowadays. We've got episodic giving now to worry about. And I think that episodic giving actually gives us an opportunity to kind of step outside the box and think about, okay, well, what could happen in the world that my program and my fundraising effort could leverage. And, you know, that, that's a, a creative outlet. It's, it's an opportunity to kind of look outside of that box that you're working in and, and think, okay, well, you know, what else could I do in my fundraising program that could diversify revenue for my organization and get more donors, get more dollars. And, and it's not part of the everyday lockstep calendar plan that we have. And even if you only do it once a year and just think about what you could leverage for episodic giving opportunities, you know, maybe it's a, a certain day of the year uh, that's related to your cause. Maybe something happens, uh, a natural disaster that uh, would be related to the work that your nonprofit does. I mean, think about those things. And, and just knowing that something like that might happen, it, you kind of take on this first responder mentality and you're always looking for it. It just, gives you a little bit more energy when you think about your program to think, well, you know what, I, I'm going to have this thing ready and I'm going to be able to capitalize on getting donors and dollars in the door because something happened. And I think that offers a little bit of a, a relief. It's, it's like, even though it's more work, mm -hmm. it's actually makes the job, I think, a little less stressful because it's not so rote. Yeah. Yeah. It adds some variety to the work, a sense of creativity. I like that. There's something else I'd like to bring up in terms of our recommendations. This comes from a pair of blog posts we wrote about nonprofit staff retention. I'll link to them in the show notes, but I want to highlight the point about having a staff hiring and retention plan. So bringing some thought to first, who are you hiring? And second, how are you supporting them once they've joined the team? That starts with screening the applicants and making sure that the people that you hire are really built for this kind of work as best as they can be. But then also, once they're hired, how are their goals defined and communicated? How does communication get handled between departments, things like that? The idea is that a lot of this problem of burnout can be avoided if you tackle it proactively right from the start. Hi, this is Curtis from IPM Advancement jumping in for a moment. If you're a nonprofit professional who has questions about your program, or maybe you feel like you've taken your advocacy, fundraising, or membership effort as far as you can and you need some fresh ideas, we have a special offer for you today. NPFX podcast listeners can get a free 30-minute consultation with IPM, no strings attached, when you go to ipmadvancement.com forward slash free. Just enter a few details and an IPM team member will contact you to follow up. It's that easy. That website again is ipmadvancement.com forward slash free. Thanks for listening and we hope to talk to you soon. Now let's return to the episode. Let's now talk about some positive examples. Again, from your experience, are you seeing nonprofits step up and address burnout? And what are they doing specifically? Sure, Curtis. I, I'm, I'm seeing this more and more where, um, and I love this because it's such a great culture. Um, mm -hmm. It's sending such a good message to its employees where nonprofits are really embracing overall wellness for their staff. And, you know, wellness can translate into many things. It can translate into different incentives and programs such as, you know, a stipend for counseling services, fitness memberships, a, a, a devoted hour of meditation. And we're seeing this more and more, especially during the pandemic where nonprofits are really encouraging their staff to embrace self-care 
And um, I'd love for other industries to do the same thing because I think that's so important to help mitigate burnout. And um, it's something that I, I personally subscribe to as well. So I think that's it's really a great thing to see nonprofits starting to embrace that mentality and that philosophy. And there's a consistency there too. The nonprofit presumably is trying to be a force for good in the world. So to bring that intention into their internal culture and support the people who are actually doing that good work, there's a consistency there that's important. It's the opposite of that toxic culture problem that we've mentioned. In the blog posts I referred to earlier, we talk a little bit about the sense of betrayal that a nonprofit employee might feel when they come into this work with a desire to do good, and then they're greeted with this high pressure, toxic work environment. That's why it's so important that your outward mission is reflected in your internal culture. Thank you for that, Diana. Any other examples of nonprofits successfully handling burnout? I have a really specific one. So um, we work with an organization called Child Help, and they run the National Child Abuse Hotline, mm. uh, which is staffed by trained counselors who take calls and texts from people reporting abuse or asking questions, and obviously from children themselves who are experiencing abuse. Um, and so, you know, not on the fundraising side, but definitely uh, a situation where there is a lot of high stress and and burnout. You can just imagine fielding some of those calls and what that, that does to a person. So at each um, office where they have the hotline, actually even I, I believe uh, in their other offices, even where they don't, the hotline is not, uh, they don't have the staff there. They have a quiet room where you can just go in and close the door and sort of be by yourself for a while and you can reset and and sort of get your mind back on track uh, and get right so that you can go back to doing what you need to do. And I think that that's something that, you know, we can all use from time to time. And, and the staff there have spoken very positively about uh, the impact, even if they're not utilizing the room frequently, knowing that it's there is, uh, you can tell that it's a relief to them. So one more thing that I want to throw in there too, um, you know, we've worked with, a number of clients who had staff that were just on the verge of burnout. And that's when they reached out to us and said, you know, what can you do for us as a full service agency? So here's the shameless self-promotion. I, I think it's a great idea to partner with someone who can take some of the more mundane tasks uh, off your plate. And so that um, you, as a, as a manager, if you're an executive director or a VP level person, who's making budgeting decisions, you know, think of the, support that you can give by bringing an agency in that could take some of those more mundane tasks off your plate uh, and, and the plate of your employee and, um, you know, put that employee in a, in a situation where they're doing more rewarding work. Maybe they start to manage a portfolio, a small portfolio. Maybe you put an annual fund person on a leadership giving pipeline development project. There's lots of ways to involve outside help to take some of that stress down and, and to really change the dynamics of your job and have it be uh, more rewarding for, for those who are more prone to burnout. Yes, the willingness to seek support, whether that's from within or outside the organization. Good. So far, we've primarily been talking about nonprofit staff who manage a single fundraising program. What about advice for agencies like IPM and consultants who manage several fundraising programs at once? For me, it's, and I know I just touched on this, but it's really about learning how to reset. So I will come out on this call as a Seahawks fan. And uh, one of the things that I love about their quarterback, Russell Wilson, is his ability to just clean the slate and move forward after a bad play. And I think when you are, managing multiple programs and working with different clients that sometimes you're going to have negative interactions, right? Or things are not going to be going well with a given program. And it can be really stressful in that moment dealing with that situation. And then five minutes later, you've got a Zoom call with a completely different client, completely different program, completely different situation that you're coming into. And you really have to be able to shake it off and get back on track so that you're able to continue to provide a solid level of service for everyone that you're working with and making sure that some of that negative energy doesn't sort of bleed over uh, into 
into the next task. Mm. Samantha, Diana, since you both have experience managing multiple programs at once, I think it would be interesting to hear about your personal self-care habits. What do you do to prevent burnout and to keep yourself in the best shape for your clients and your families too, for that matter? That is probably the most important question that you've asked during this call. <laughs> I think for anyone, what is your, what is your self-care regimen, right? I would first start off by saying you should never neglect mental health and the power of esprit de corps. Um, surrounding yourself with positive energy individuals to help that help lift you up cannot be understated for me personally. I tend to in my personal and even my, in my personal life and in my professional life, I use a lot of laughter and humor. I try to laugh at least several times a day because when I'm laughing, I'm smiling. Mm. And when I'm smiling, I, I lift myself up. And I think that's so incredibly important. I also use laughter in my personal life. I think the biggest thing you could find in your personal life is an outlet, particularly during COVID-19 where it's a challenge. And, you know, some of us are at home all the time with small children who are doing schooling online. As Sam mentioned earlier, it's, it's a challenge. I love to incorporate fitness into as a core outlet. Um, it helps me redirect, reset, refocus. And it's also, I'm very goal oriented. It's, I've said this in a previous blog post, it's, it's very metrics focused where each day can be a new personal best. Um, and I think that's really important. I would also say, you know, it, it, that I ensure that I, I break up the pace during the day by taking a walk outside, getting some capitalizing on that vitamin D as much as I possibly can. And I think for me personally, and I, and I know Sam does this too, we thrive by being able to have our priority lists a list of what are the seven things I must accomplish today, both personally and professionally. And I find, and I sort it by what's the most, what's the greatest need, what's the of the utmost importance and I tackle it. And for me personally, there really truly is no greater satisfaction than crossing something off on my list mm -hmm. because it gives me a sense of accomplishment and it makes me feel like I'm moving forward, which yeah. I think is really important. Feels so good. Yeah. Yeah. See, and this is why Diana and I get along so well, because I agree with everything that she said, and she and I share um, a lot of the same outlets. I, when I'm thinking about sort of stress and burnout and self-care, I try to focus on like both chronic and acute solutions. Mm. So from a longer term perspective, I have learned that sleep is very important to me, not just the amount of sleep, but the quality of sleep. So, you know, I got myself a sleep tracker. I try and make sure I'm getting enough of that good, deep restorative sleep that I need, because I've noticed that when I am not well rested, everything else sort of falls apart from there. So that's sort of my, one of my other longer term rules that I try and abide by. And then this quick trick that I learned this year, actually, when of course I'm madly Googling ways to sort of de-stress <laughs> is this thing called panoramic vision. And it sounds weird, but uh, this neuroscientist, Andrew Humerman says that when you look straight ahead and you sort of let your peripheral vision open up, it lowers your stress level. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I take a quick minute and literally a minute <laughs> because sometimes that's all I have. And I look out at the horizon or I try and just sort of look away from my surroundings and let my peripheral vision open up. And it really works very well when I just need that quick reset to sort of brush off whatever I've been dealing with and get back to what I need to be doing. So I encourage everyone to, I think what works for some people doesn't work for others. So you got to know yourself and try different things out. And if you have to keep a little list, I used to do that too, where it would be like, okay, when I feel crappy, I'm going to go to this list and I'm going to try something on it. And eventually you'll sort of build this toolbox that you can use as needed. Great. Russ, is there anything you wanted to add about things that you do personally? I'll add one thing for me, Curtis, because I know it's different for everybody, as I believe Sam said. You got to figure it out for yourself. But I think, you know, one of the things for me that has happened during COVID is we adopted a dog and we had other pups and we lost them a couple of years ago after having them around for about 16 years each. Um, we were missing having that 
canine companion. And, mm. uh, and so we recently adopted a dog, uh, rescued a dog and go for adoption if you can. So a little plug there, but he, he's just wonderful. And it's brought a, a, a reason for me to get out of the house, first mm. of all, because I'm a homebody and, um, I get out of the house with him and kind of like that, um, approach that Steve jobs talked a lot about in terms of, you know, he, he would like to have walking meetings. I go out on my walking meetings with the dog and I talk to him a little bit and see how he's doing. And I think it's that combination of just getting out of my immediate environment Mm -hmm. combined with actually having to care for another creature. It's that combination that's very restorative. Hmm. Thank you, all three of you, for sharing those personal practices. I will be stealing a couple of those ideas, I promise you. <laughs> and I'd like to add a few things that have been working for me, too. So uh, the first one is I try to stay tuned in to how I'm doing and realistically assess what I'm capable of on any given day. What I mean is not ignoring the effect of the stress of COVID, the shutdowns, uh, the isolation, all that. To be a little gentler and not compare myself with maybe the more productive version of myself when I'm at my best. So if I'm tired or distracted and it's going to take me, say, two hours to do something that maybe a year ago took me an hour, that's OK. You know, don't beat myself up. So it's that gentle acceptance. What do I have to contribute? What do I actually have to contribute on any given day? So that's kind of the mindset piece. A more practical thing I use to, to stay sane is music. I uh, strategically use music for all kinds of things. Diana mentioned working out. I love to crank my heavy metal music when I, whenever I work out. It turns what can feel like a chore. You know, I got to do my workout today. It turns that into, uh, it's going to sound silly, but it's like a fun mini rock concert. Uh, and other chores too. You know, I'll put my headphones on when I do the dishes or mow the lawn or whatever. It's just this really simple shortcut that can snap me out of whatever funk I'm in. All right. So my last question for you is, what's one thing that we've discussed today or maybe something that hasn't come up yet, but you think it's really important that you'd like listeners to take away? So if they're going to take away one thing from this podcast episode, what would you like that to be? So I would say the one thing, my biggest takeaway would be, look, don't neglect your physical or mental health. Take time for you. You do you um, so that you can actually be the best version of yourself and you can be productive and you can thrive. And I would say, don't be afraid to ask for help, number one. Number two, this time that we're in with COVID and with everything that's gone on in the past year, uh, I think it allows all of us a chance for some self-reflection and for a chance to really think about whether we're well aligned with our jobs and what we really want to do in our lives. And so if you have the opportunity to kind of do an inventory of uh, what you want to do and compare it with what you are doing in terms of your job and check out those gaps. And if there is um, a path for you to kind of address those gaps, I would encourage you to do it. If there's not, you know, that's a reason to start thinking forward, you know, think of the future, think of what you want to do in advancement. Um, maybe you don't want to stay in nonprofit fundraising. Maybe you want to do something different. Um, how can you take that next step? Because I think ultimately what ends up happening is, um, you know, burnout is usually a very frightening thing and, and it can kind of create a lot of chaos in your life. But in my experience, those times of burnout in, in nonprofit fundraising, where you're just completely burnt out from a job or a situation 
they, they lead you, they force you to make a change. And oftentimes that change ends up being good, but that discomfort of having to go through it via burnout is what the problem is. So if you can plan ahead and look ahead and take the time for yourself kind of upfront, it'll help you avoid burnout. It'll, I think, help smooth those transitions for you as you make your way through life. And then I, I just want to Again, shameless self-promotion. If you're in a situation at a nonprofit where you could use some help, uh, please reach out to us. Give us a call because we're a full service agency. So we could um, really help reformulate your job or uh, help your employees if you're in a management or leadership position. And uh, we'd love to talk to you. And for me, I think it really comes down to communication, which we've all sort of said throughout this podcast, but maybe not explicitly. So Don't let things get to a point where you feel completely hopeless before you start taking action. And I know that's really what burnout is. um, But often once you reach that point, if you take a step back and look, there have been hints along the way. It doesn't come out of nowhere. You know, everything sort of adds up until you get that, that straw that broke the camel's back. So try and recognize those things and ask for help before you need it or as soon as you need it. So you don't get into this, to this place where you can't find a way out. Although for some of us, I recognize, you know, myself sometimes, uh, to Russ's point, it's almost better when I back myself into a corner because then I have to act. Mm. But during the times when I am able to sort of step back and identify problems as I go and address them as I go, I can avoid that extreme discomfort And I can still get to a really great place, just maybe with a a little less angst. You know, I'm really happy we ended on this point about communication. We are social animals and communication bridges that gap between us that a lot of us are feeling right now, working from home or just feeling isolated or stressed. So reach out to your team and reach out to us here at IPM if there's some way we can help you can contact us at ipmadvancement.com. So that concludes our conversation on self-care for nonprofit fundraisers, our first podcast episode of the new year. Thanks to the panel for sharing their insights and expertise. I'll link to those blog posts and surveys we mentioned in the show notes. We also invite you to explore our free library of white papers, infographics, and blog articles in the learn section of the IPM website. That address is ipmadvancement.com forward slash learn. If you like this episode, please subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. And if you'd like to help us reach more nonprofit professionals like yourself, please leave us a review or share this episode with your network. That would help us a lot. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time. (music) 